Uh, a few details from the lectionary readings this week uh, really stood out to me, and I wanted to share a few, just a few of the things, uh, some of the textual details from these texts that uh, really jumped out to me as I was reading them um, today. The readings for this week, uh, the Old Testament readings from Second Samuel, uh, it's the beginning of Second Samuel, uh, chapter one, uh, right in the transition between uh, Saul's leadership and David's leadership. And this is the moment when um, Saul uh, and Jonathan fall in battle, and um, David is responding to that news. Um, so it's a really gripping narrative. Um, and it's one of the strategic moments in the book of Samuel. As Hannah's song, uh, David's lament here in Second Samuel one, and then David's last some of David's last words. These three poetic texts that bind together First and Second Samuel. I've always been struck by this particular text because right here at the beginning of this new phase uh, there's a lament uh, and it's very gripping um, and it's a it's a dramatic tale too because the messenger comes up to David thinking that he is going to get some cred for uh, announcing that Saul has been defeated and that he is he himself has um, was the one who killed him uh, but David responds very differently of course and has this messenger killed um, because he had said, I have slain the Lord's anointed. And so David gives this lament that he teaches to all of Israel. Um, and it's a song uh, that um, expresses his heart at this moment. And one of the things he says um, here uh, in verse 19 of the reading, So your glory, O Israel, lies slain on the heights. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. O mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither rain nor dew nor fields that yield offerings of grain. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Jerusalem, O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. So in the context of Second Samuel, First and Second Samuel, of course, uh, the fall of Saul and the rise of David is tied to the story of uh, God's choosing, God's providence, the unfaithfulness of Saul. Um, of course, this pattern recurs with David, uh, but here uh, David is not only lamenting uh, the king of Israel, but the Lord's anointed and all that that meant uh, at that moment. And this uh, very striking phrase, oh, how the mighty have fallen, because the Lord's anointed, the one who was uh, set apart for a task to lead God's people, has fallen. Uh, so he fell first uh, in unfaithfulness, and he falls here at the hands of the enemies of Israel. A very uh, striking uh, text uh, for, for a number of reasons. So in the context of uh, lament, uh, a song of lament that is being uh, for uh, Saul from David and Jonathan, who was uh, not, as, not culpable in the way that Saul was, the lament of a friend, the lament of an enemy that was nevertheless the Lord's anointed. Psalm 130 is the, the reading from the psalm that was sung um, likely by those who are going up to Jerusalem uh, for pilgrimage um, to celebrate Passover and the related feasts. And so this was also a, a group of psalms in the book of Psalms, the psalms, the songs of ascent. As they're going up to the temple, uh, singing songs of joy um, and songs of worship, but also songs of repentance, 
Um, so the reading for today uh, is Psalm 130. In the context of uh, uh, Israel, uh, return from exile or return to the temple uh, after being away from a time, there's this sense in which as you approach the throne, as you approach uh, God's presence in the temple, you have to do it with a right heart. So Psalm 130 comes in and says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins. So in the, in the reading, this particular juxtaposition of these texts, the lament of David is answered by the call to repentance. Um, in, in these contexts, this uh, kind of resonance uh, between the sin of David, uh, the sin of Saul, uh, in the falling, the mighty have fallen, the Lord's anointed is laying on the field on the Mount Gilboa. And here, climbing another mount, uh, there's this call for repentance. O oh Lord, if you kept a record of my sins, who could stand? Saul was not able to stand. He was slain on Mount Gilboa and he never got up. Uh, Jonathan was not able to stand. The psalmist reflects here going up on this other mountain, uh, toward uh, the uh, the mountain in Jerusalem, and he says, he exclaims, "If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand?" Uh, so this uh, answers this kind of this. Uh, we see this image of the the Lord's anointed slain on the mountain, and the worshiper uh, moving toward the temple in Jerusalem in the context of worship, prayer, and repentance, uh, saying, "O Lord, who could stand?" Uh, the gospel reading uh, for the final. A reading for this week is from Mark chapter 5. In chapter 5, this is a uh, within narrative of a lot of the things that Jesus is doing, uh, healing and teaching. And in the midst of this uh, is where the story comes in. Uh, There's a story, it says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came over. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. And in this, Mark uh, gives us one of his Markin sandwiches, uh, his inclusios, where he uh, starts a story here, and then he gives us another snapshot of a story, and then completes the story. And the story here is of the woman who had been bleeding for years, and had seen all kinds of doctors, and the sickness had persisted. Um, so she was just suffering year after year. And of course, she goes up and touches the hem of his garment, whereas uh, it's, a, it's a really striking image where this woman, for so many years, uh, blood has been pouring out of her. As she touches Jesus, Jesus' power pours out of him, and she is healed, right? And Jesus makes this uh, note of who touched me, uh, drawing attention to the fact that this woman has touched him and has been healed by his power. Um, of course, the uh, disciples are around and saying, there's a big crowd here, and you say, who touched you? But I think Jesus is pointing out uh, the power that he has uh, in this moment to heal uh, not only someone in an instant but someone who has been uh, uh, hurting and uh, in pain for a long time and of course the woman comes up and says uh, it was I who, who touched you uh, and he said that your faith has, has healed you and then this is the point at which um, the, the rest of the story picks back up um, Jesus says to the, uh, the woman, uh, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Beautiful expression. And so while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the synagogue of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and said, Your daughter is dead. Why bother him anymore? And Jesus ignores what they say and says to the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid. Just believe. And this is when they get to the house. He calls up Peter, James, and John. Uh, and they go to the home of the synagogue ruler. Jesus sees a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. 
he goes in and says to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give him to give her something to eat. So this amazing story of Jesus' healing, as I'm thinking about this an, on its own terms, this is a really interesting story, of course, and it has a particular place uh, that it's, it's uh, functioning in, in Mark's narrative. But as I was reading uh, the story of Saul and Jonathan and David's lament uh, on the Mount Gilboa. The, the Lord's anointed is slain because of sin, because of unfaithfulness, because of the enemies of the Lord triumphing in this case. In the context of the song of ascent, of saying, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. So here in the story of Mark, to finish out these readings, here, the contrast that I found so striking was, oh, how the mighty have fallen. And here, one of the uh, a textual detail of the account is, uh, he, they keep calling her my little daughter. So one of the littlest in Israel has fallen. Here, the mighty, the, one of the mightiest, most well-known Israelite has fallen, a leader. Here, the littlest, uh, one of the littlest Israelites has fallen, uh, who is unknown, <laughs> uh, uh, aside from her father and her family. Um, and so here, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Oh, how the little daughter of Israel has fallen. The king of Israel has fallen. The daughter of Israel has fallen. And so in some ways I see, uh, we can see the Psalm 130 and the Samuel narrative and uh, Mark's narrative uh, answering one another as Jesus uh, speaks into this uh, little girl's life and says, get up, <laughs> get up off of, uh, come away from death uh, into life. And he not only raises her, but he nourishes her, give her something to eat. Uh, and he equips her um, to do the next thing. I thought this was a striking juxtaposition of these texts and it, it caused me to reflect on uh, the, the effects of, the tragic effects of sin God's providence, uh, the means by which we can be included in those who are called to come up and who don't fall away on the mountain, and that is repentance. Uh, the, our only hope is that the Lord has forgiven us and that one day Jesus speaks into our life and says, my child, rise, because one day you will rise. You will be forgiven from your sin. The thing that kills you physically but also uh, spiritually right so I think this is a, a beautiful connection here as we strive to uh, follow the Lord's guidance as we strive to fight our sin and as we hope in the resurrection that only comes uh, through the one who can say child get up